Yeah, so Jerry Schimmel is our speaker today, and he is a Denver-based sportscaster who, um, and is the voice of the University of Northern Colorado football and basketball teams currently, and also the creator and host of a syndicated radio show called Amazing Americans. Jerry spent a decade broadcasting the Colorado Rockies games on both radio and TV, and was the broadcast voice for the Denver Nuggets for 18 seasons from 1992 to 2010. Uh, he was, um, I lost myself, um, on both radio and TV. And prior to that, to the Nuggets, he spent two seasons as the broadcaster of the Minnesota Timberwolves. He practiced law for four years in Topeka, Kansas, and that's actually our connection, how we got connected. It was my, my connection in Topeka and his connections in Topeka. And um, then spent a year as the deputy commissioner and legal counsel for the Continental Basketball Association. Schimmel um, is the author of the book Chosen to Live, which chronicles his survival uh, of the crash of the United Airlines Flight 232 in Sioux City, Iowa in 1989, which we're going to hear about today, and its subsequent effects on his life. He's also the author of a book called The Extravagant, Extravagant Gift, which is an evangelistic um, outreach booklet. Um, and he's been featured on several national programs, including um, an extended feature on ESPN in 2009. In addition to this, he has competed in three marathons and nine triathlons. Uh, he twice has rode his bicycle across the United States as a fundraiser, fundraiser for two Denver area charities. And in June of 2015, he successfully completed the race across America as part of a two-man cycling relay team, which covered 3,000 miles in seven and a half days. I'm tired just reading the sentence, <clears throat> and my legs hurt. Um, yes, that's incredible. Um, and the, they, they won the overall two-person relay division. Um, a documentary about the effort called Godspeed was released in 2016. And in two, September of 2017, he set an official age group record in the race across Colorado, 468 miles from Utah to Kansas, and in the summer of 2018, he was part of a two-person cycling relay team that completed all four directions across Colorado, um, breaking the two-person record in all four of those races. A lot of bicycling. Um, Jerry spent one season in 2009 as the head baseball coach for Metro State College of Denver after being a volunteer assistant at the school for two years and has been a volunteer assistant at Colorado Christian University as well. He earned his law degree in 1985 from Washburn University in Topeka after receiving his undergraduate from the same school in 1982. Um, he also played baseball at Washburn and later was an assistant coach for the school for three years. Um, before transferring to Washburn, he went to South Dakota State University for two years and played on their baseball team as well. Jerry grew up in Madison, uh, South Dakota, and now resides in Aurora, Colorado with his wife, Diane. They have two adult children, Maggie and Ryan. Would you please welcome Jerry Schimmel? people uh, near Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, we don't have as many traffic lights as you guys have, and we don't have a runza. So otherwise, we're pretty close to you guys. Uh, I am going to share with you guys uh, this morning something that completely changed my life that Pastor Jeff hit on, and that was a plane crash that I survived uh, 32 years ago. And there are a couple things before I talk about that crash I want to make clear to you guys. Number one is, I know there's some young people in the room um, I am not trying to scare anybody by telling you about a plane crash. It's a very safe means of transportation. In fact, I read this not too long ago. If you take a trip of 500 miles or more, um, there is 
a, a seven times greater chance you will die in a car accident if you drive 500 miles than if you fly. From Denver to Kansas City, where we have families, about 500 miles. We made that trip uh, dozens of times over the years. I think about that a lot. Uh, it's seven times safer to fly from, t from Denver to Kansas City than it is to drive. Aviation travel is a very safe means of transportation, but things happen sometimes, and I'm going to tell you what happened to me in that regard. Secondly, my wife said this a long time ago, and I think it's very accurate. She said this, everybody has their own plane crash. Everybody has their own plane crash. There are plane crashes all across this room. I know that. I don't know what you guys' plane crashes are, but you have them. You have plane crashes in your life. It may not be as bad as what I went through. It might be worse than what I went through. I talked to someone after the first service who had their son pass away at age 18. I can't even, imagine, I can't even fathom that. I can't, I can't even put myself in that position to lose a child, I'd go through a thousand plane crashes before I'd, I'd offer to, to have one of my kids pass away. Everybody has their own plane crash. I've got mine, and I'm not down, trying to downplay what you guys have been through. Uh, let me tell you about it, and, and I'll try to make it brief because I think the crash itself is important, but what has happened in my life after that is more important, and that's the good part for me. So 32 years ago, I still can't believe it's been that long, but 32 years ago, I survived the crash, United Airlines Flight 232 in Sioux City, Iowa, as Jeff told you. I was working back then in Denver for the Continental Basketball Association. It was the NBA's minor league system, and our office back then was based in Denver. I had been practicing law and doing sports back in Topeka, Kansas where we, Jeff and I have our connection. Uh, talk about a small world, uh, Jeff actually taught for a while at the high school that my wife graduated from. Who would ever thought that I would, that would be, have that connection? Anyway, um, I was, I was uh, working as a broadcaster in Topeka, and I was uh, practicing law, moved out here in the out to Denver in the spring of 1989, and went to work as a deputy commissioner and legal counsel for the CBA. I was also doing games. They allowed me to do some freelance stuff. I, I was doing a, a game or two a month on ESPN, some college basketball, some other things. But my main duties when I got hired in the spring of 1989 was to help run this minor league system for the NBA. Jay Ramsdale was a commissioner of the league, and Jay and I were good friends and known each other in the league for a couple of years, and uh, Jay hired me in that spring of 1989 to come to Denver and kind of be his right-hand man. We were flying on July 19th from Denver to Chicago on business. We are going to go to Chicago, make connection there, go on to Columbus, Ohio. Next day in Columbus was a CBA's college draft. We are going to draft our players the next day. We were supposed to fly at 7 o'clock in the morning. We got out the old airport in Denver, Stapleton Airport, and found out that our flight was canceled. Now, if you've ever flown and had your flight canceled, you know it's a lot of work getting rebooked and getting your plans redone on the other end, letting your family know all that stuff that goes along with that. So we had to face that. So we finally got to a ticket counter, Jay and I did, and we're informed that we've been put on standby status for the next four flights to Chicago. Standby means, of course, those planes are full, but if somebody doesn't show up at a certain time and you have priority, you can take that seat. Finally, guys, the fourth standby flight. Now, it's the fifth one overall. Count the one we got bumped off originally. It turns out to be United Flight 232. We were not supposed to be on that plane. We were supposed to take off five and a half hours before we actually got on the plane. Now, I shared this in the first service as well, but it, it's so funny to me. In the 32 years subsequent to this event, there have been an amazing number of people who have told me over these years that they were supposed to be on our flight with us. But for some reason, these people didn't get on. They changed plans. They canceled their plans, whatever it is. If everybody was telling the truth about this, we would have 9,000 people aboard this aircraft. It is amazing. It's amazing how many people. My late father used to say, that's the most overbooked flight in aviation history right there. Because he had people telling him he lived in Florida in the last couple of years of his life. And people would come up to him and say, hey, I'm supposed to be on that flight with your son. Dad's like, hey, get in line. Everybody else was too, apparently. It was actually the opposite for Jay and I. We were not supposed to be on that flight. We are supposed to take off at 7 o'clock in the morning. We got on a plane at 2.15 in the afternoon. We got the last two seats aboard this aircraft. Turns out to be a DC-10. If you're unfamiliar with uh, aircrafts, the DC-10 is called a jumbo jet, three-engine aircraft. You can fit almost 300 people in there, 37 rows. It's a, it's a big plane. Jay got uh, row 23. I got a ticket that said, I'm sorry, Jay was in row 30. I got a ticket that said row 23. We got the last two seats aboard this aircraft, completely full. I remember walking down the ramp to the plane. The flight attendant was walking with us, and she said, hey, if you guys could hurry up and, and get on the plane. We're running a little bit late, and we did that. And finally, after five and a half hours, we got two, two seats on this plane to Chicago. We're running extremely late, and we got a lot of work to do at the other end, but we're in a plane. 
So we take off for Chicago. We were told perfect conditions, 83 degrees when we left, no expected turbulence, smooth ride all the way to Chicago from Denver, about a two-hour flight. Some of you may know the story. We got about halfway there. We got 59 minutes into this flight when something happened to the aircraft that started a series of events, I think more accurate to say, that led us to crash land in Sioux City. And that defining moment was an explosion. It came from the back of the plane. I heard it first, and then I could feel it kind of come through the cabin from the back to the front of the plane, kind of this reverb type of thing. And uh, it, it dropped trays off, uh, up, uh, plates off of trays, and, and just a lot of chaos uh, when, we, when we heard it and we felt it, and then we started to drop. And I remember thinking to myself, all right, um, this explosion is a bomb going off. I mean, that was my first thought. And about six months before this, Pan Am 103, some of you might remember that. It's still in the news, by the way. I did a search for it the other day, and they're still talking about Pan Am 103. It was down by a terrorist bomb over Scotland, happened just six months before our crash. And I thought, wow, this has happened to us, same thing. Bomb has gone off, set by a terrorist, and, and that's it for everybody. We started to drop, and panic took over the cabin, as you might guess. And uh, after about 15 seconds, seemed a lot longer at that time, 15, 20 seconds or so, through a chaos of dropping and panic ripping through the cabin, we started to ease back up out of that drop. I could feel the plane start to, to come back up again. At least that was the sensation. And after about two minutes or so, it felt like we leveled off. We weren't dropping anymore. We were going forward, and then we waited very anxiously. Now, some of the panic subsided. We waited very anxiously for someone to tell us, all right, what's happened to this plane? What kind of predicament we are now in? And that came about five minutes after the explosion when Captain Al Haynes, our cockpit captain, got on the PA system the first time and told us this. He said, what you heard and felt was not a bomb going off. It was a number two engine. The DC-10 has three engines. The one and the three are hanging from the wings. The number two is in top and back of the plane. He said, the number two engine exploded. He said, when it, when it did, it injured the rear of the aircraft. And these were exact words. He said, we're having a lot of trouble controlling this plane. He said, we've been given a directive to make an emergency landing in Sioux City, Iowa. He said, I want everybody in their seats. Their seat belts are buckled. They're pulled tight. They're fastened. You cannot get out of your seat under any circumstance. You can't get up and go to the bathroom. You can't get up and talk to people. You have to stay in your seat, he said, because we are in serious trouble. Exact words. And we were. And I didn't know this till later, but when the explosion uh, took place, not a bomb going off, but as Captain Haynes said, the number two engine exploding. When it did, it took out the entire hydraulic system in the aircraft in this DC-10. There are three systems in the, of hydraulics in a DC-10. The operational system is number one, the backup is number two, the second backup is number three. The NTSB came out a couple months after the crash and said that there was a one in a billion chance, B, one in a billion chance of any kind of engine explosion in that number two engine compartment could sever all three hydraulic systems. But we beat the odds in a big way, I guess, that day. It severed all, the, all three of the systems. Complete hydraulic failure had never happened in aviation history. The cockpit crew realized that they had very little control of the plane. They were able to grab the remaining throttles and kind of keep the plane going and in the air. After that drop, we kind of felt that. And we give, it, give them that directive, make an emergency landing in Sioux City, Iowa. They tried to slow the plane down to make uh, an attempt at a safe landing. And when they did, by slowing the plane down, I mean pulling back on the one and the three throttles, when they did that, the plane would jerk off to the right. And we almost uh, went into a nosedive a couple of different times when they were trying that. So they realized they couldn't go straight, they couldn't take a left turn, and they couldn't pull back on the remaining throttles to slow the plane down. So the only chance they had was to land the plane hard in Sioux City and just kind of hope for the best. A normal DC-10 landing, it's about 125 miles an hour when touch the ground, depending on the wind. We hit at 255, which by itself is a disaster. There's no way you can land a plane that big at that airspeed. As well, we're dropping too fast. There's no hydraulics. There's no steering. There's no brakes. It's, it's, uh, you put all those things together, and you've got potential disaster, and, and that's exactly what happened. We were coming in so hard, so fast. We hit down, and immediately, I mean, we slammed down. I, for all the introspecting about what it might be like and what the flight attendants told us it might be like and Captain Haynes telling us that we need to get ready, it's going to be a hard landing. Uh, I wasn't ready for how hard we hit. And as soon as we did, it was complete chaos inside the cabin. I mean, it was, it was crazy. A lot of young people in here, I won't get into details. 
hit down and uh, we slid um, about 1,400 feet. And then I remember telling myself, all right, um, I'm in that brace position, which we had practiced actually, where you cross your arms, grab the seat back in front of you, and wedge your forehead in that seat back in front of you. And I was looking around and seeing all this chaos with bodies and smoke and fire and debris and thinking, all right, something's got to hit me. And amazingly, nothing ever did. And after about 15 seconds, I thought to myself, all right, we fit down hard. Um, we're going to now, though, it felt like anyway, coast to a stop. And I thought, I'll assess things then. By the time I had that thought, we flipped over frontwards. We kind of cartwheeled end to end. The nose of the plane dug into the runway, and we flipped over. And if you uh, have not seen the video of this, it was actually videotaped by a local TV cameraman. That's about where the video picks up. You can see the plane kind of go behind some buildings, hit the ground. If you look real close or zoom in, you can see the nose hit, and we kind of flip over. Uh, and then it really got chaotic. It broke into four big pieces and literally thousands of little ones. I'm in row 23. There are 37 rows in a DC-10. And I end up a, in a piece of the plane that's rows about 22 through 28 or 29, pretty small section compared to some of the other ones. We flipped over once, broke off in the plane, and kept sliding upside down and backwards for another 4,100 feet. So from start to finish, well over a mile. Came to a hole in a cornfield next to the airport. I'm still hanging upside down on my chair. My chair's intact. My seatbelt's intact. One of the very few people in my area in that position. And I'm buckling my seatbelt and drop down the ceiling now because we're upside down. And I didn't see any way to get out. I was going to try the emergency exit, which is off to my right. It was gone. There was nothing left of it. It was a wall of burning scrap, basically. And I had this wall of smoke coming from the front of our piece of the plane toward the back, real slowly kind of moving toward us. And because a fuel tank had ruptured in front of us, that sent the smoke in our way. So we had no choice but to start going backwards uh, toward the back of the plane. I, I, my instinct for some reason was go forward, but I think it was because there was another emergency exit up in front of me. That was the closest one, but I had no choice but to go back. Countered a couple other guys like myself who were about my age, weren't hurt seriously like me, and one of them said to the two of us, he said, let's just start helping some people and maybe we can find a way out in the process. It's exact words. That I, I, like he said them yesterday, I remember them. So we started working our way to the back of the plane, realizing a lot of people were not survivors, but we were moving toward the people who were moving themselves and kind of pushing the back of the plane. And after what I'm guessing is about two, maybe three minutes, I turned around in my right. I saw, I saw some movement off to my right, and I saw this woman kind of moving over here, and, and then I saw sunlight. I saw sunlight coming into this dark a cabin full of smoke, and I saw people moving through that hole to the outside into that sunlight. And I thought, okay, that's, that's how we're getting out. That's my way to get out. I'll stay in as long as I can and help and get out then. I made my way to that hole. I remember looking back and trying to see if maybe I could grab somebody, and I couldn't see anything completely full of smoke at that point. And got outside of the plane and stepped into a cornfield. And I was very familiar with the cornfield. You have them around here, I know. Uh, I grew up in South Dakota. That's about all we have. And I worked in a cornfield. Um, and by the way, pulling weeds in a cornfield for $1 an hour might be the worst job in America. All right? It was, uh, we worked 10 hours, and I got a $10 bill at the end of the day. I thought that was a lot of money back then. But man, I look back at it now, I was like, man, what a terrible job. Uh, we did get fed, though. We got fed very well by the farmer's wife every time we did that. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm in a cornfield, and that gave me a little bit of comfort, at least I, I could kind of get my bearings a little bit. And I started to move away from the aircraft when something happened um, that, that I want to preface before I tell you guys exactly what happened by saying this. Uh, I'm not trying to down, downplay what I did. I'm not trying to be overly humble about what happened. But I got labeled a hero after this crash because I went back in and grabbed this little girl. And I'll be honest with you guys, as honest as I can be, that hero tag never felt right to me. It always felt artificial. I was always uncomfortable with it. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I got outside the plane. I heard a baby crying back inside the wreckage. And I can tell you guys what I didn't do. I didn't stand there and weigh the risks. I really did not. I didn't st stand there and think, if I go back in the plane, I might not find my way back out, or the thing might explode. I certainly didn't stand there and think, if I go back in this uh, plane and grab this little girl, I'll be this national hero and be on the Oprah Winfrey show next week. And, you know, I couldn't, uh, couldn't wait to hear what diet she's on this week. And my mom watches Oprah. Maybe I get her autograph, my mom. Um, none of that happened. I heard a baby crying, and the next thing I know, I'm back inside the plane on all fours over top of the crying. There was a little girl who was 11 months old. There's probably some close to 11 month old uh, people in this room um, who was sitting in row 11, so way up in the front. I'm in row, again, row 23, and by now I'm in row 27 or 28. 
There was an 11-month-old girl sitting on the floor between her mom's feet, um, which is the policy back then on emergency landings. If an infant didn't have its own seat, you put it on the floor with pillows around it between the parent's feet. Because of our crash, that has now changed. A new mandate with the FAA about a year after our crash, and that is that if an infant doesn't have its own seat today, you put it in your lap and put the strap around both of you, uh, which they uh, claim is much safer, and, and I believe that. Anyway, Sabrina Michelson was this little girl's name. She's sitting in row 11. We hit the ground. She's thrown from her mom's grasp to the back of the plane, ends up, get this, ends up inside an overhead bin that closes and latches on her. She's locked in this thing. She's stuck in it, and it's completely intact. It's not damaged at all. So I go back to the plane, and I'm, I'm, I'm over top of the crying, and I'm feeling it. I can't see anything because there's smoke, and I'm feeling around. I go, man, there's, there's a kid inside the overhead bin. So it's below me now. Instead of above me, I find a latch. I, I unlock it. I lift the lid up, and as soon as I grab the child, she stopped crying. Then I did something. I have no idea why I did this, but I closed the overhead bin lid again, made sure it was latched. I have no idea why I did this. All those years of flying where the flight attendant says, be careful, things could shift inside the door. I don't, I don't know. You're going to think I really need counseling when I say this, but th this is true still today, 32 years later. I still have dreams about that, and I lift the baby out in my dream. I close that overhead bin, and you know that clicking sound, it wakes me up in my dream. You're looking at me like, this guy is crazy. He's half crazy. Um, I still have that dream. In fact, I had it maybe six months ago. Um, pretty pretty crazy. Anyway, I grabbed the baby, and I found the opening, got outside the plane the second time. And if that's heroic in somebody's mind, and they get some kind of good out of that, that's great. I have no problem with that at all. But I know the way that it happened. I didn't think it through. It, it just sort of happened instinctually, I, I believe. And uh, instinctively, not instinctually. That's not a word, I don't think. Instinct, instinctively. Um, and, you know, if you think about a hero, isn't, it, isn't a hero, you can make this your own decision on this, but isn't a hero somebody who weighs that risk, who thinks it all through, and then does it anyway? Military personnel, they know what's at stake. They're still signing up. They're still serving. I think a hero is somebody who weighs that risk, thinks it through, and does it anyway. I didn't do that. Anyway, I got the child in my hands, and, I, and I'm thinking now about an explosion. So I start running away from the aircraft thinking this thing might explode behind me. Because um, what happens to the hero on TV every time he gets out of something that's burning? What happens to it? It explodes every time. Happens once an episode on MacGyver. You ever notice that? I need a show of hands. How many people have seen at least one episode of MacGyver? Yeah, it's a whole room full here. Probably online as well. All right. Uh, this is crazy because MacGyver always gets out of something that's burning, right? And he, and he gets thrown. He rolls around a little bit. But my wife noticed this. That blonde hair never moves. You ever notice that about MacGyver? Now, I've got two questions about that. Number one is, what kind of hairspray does that dude wear? Because that's pretty powerful stuff right there. And secondly, and more important at least to me, why is my wife noticing anything about MacGyver? Why is she staring... <laughs> Why is she staring at him on that TV? I got something to ask Diane when I get home. Um, where was I? Oh, um, I'm thinking about an explosion. Really, for the first time since we hit down, I'm thinking I'm weighing a risk that's going to explode. I started running through the, the cornfield, trying to catch up to everybody that come out in front of me. It never did explode. It burnt to a black shell, basically. In fact, I think we have a, a, a shot of this. Wayne is up there, ready to hit the button, I think. But I think we've got a shot of, um, yeah, that's an aerial view of the wreckage. And as you can see, it's strewn everywhere. I couldn't even tell you from that one, the piece of the plane that I was in. I don't think that was it for me. I think I was um, down into the, the left a little bit as you look at it from your vantage point. But um, it was crazy. There was wreckage everywhere. Um, there were parts of the plane, big parts like that, that were separated by 250 yards. In fact, Sabrina Michelson was with her family. Um, her brothers were t uh, four and six, and Sabrina was less than a year, and their parents, so all five survived the crash. Um, they are 200 yards apart from us. They ended up in that section behind first class. We were 250 yards apart almost in the cornfield um, and where the plane breaks. Sabrina was able to get to the back of the plane before it broke and, and got to that overhead bin. I wish that I could tell you that that story ended beautifully uh, with Sabrina Michelson. Um, if I'd have written the script, or if I could have written the script, I would have written a lot differently, but it, uh, people ask me about her. Her family's doing great, but Sabrina passed away of a drug overdose um, in 2007. Yeah, 2007. She was a sophomore at Arizona State. We still don't know whether it was accidental or suicidal. We think it's probably accidental, but 
Um, uh, when I did the Rockies, I did them for 10 years. We had spring training in Phoenix, and we'd go out, my wife and I, to her grave, which is in uh, Mesa, Arizona. Anyway, I keep going uh, through the, plane, uh, through the uh, cornfield, away from the plane, and find a woman who would come out in front of me, and I said, hey, would you please take this baby? I don't know who she is or where her family is, but would you please take her? And she said, sure. I knew this woman was okay because it helped her out the back of the plane. So she said, sure. So I hand the, ba- <laughs> I hand the baby off to this woman, and then she looks at me, and she says, oh, where's the baby's diaper bag? I'm like, oh, seriously, I didn't have an answer for that, Uh, you know, you uh, spouses, I know you do this, when when your spouse asks you something you don't have the answer to, you just act like you didn't hear the question, right, Uh, kids do that a lot, my kids do, Um, I'm like, you don't don't even answer, I mean, diaper bag, and and, and I have to defend her, Margot uh, Crane is her name, I have to defend her, because after that, she said, I didn't answer, she said, oh, it's okay, don't worry about the diaper bag, I was like, are you sure, and I can run back the plane, (laughs) see if I can find it. I should not have closed that overhead bin lid. It might have been in there. Anyway, um, the result of Flight 232 was that 112 people passed away out of 296. And if you see the videotape, um, you'll wonder how anybody can come out of that crash alive. I mean, I, I have seen it literally hundreds of times, and I ask the same question. But almost two-thirds of us survived the crash. Jay Ramsdale, my boss and great friend, uh, perished. He was sitting uh, seven rows behind me, as I said, in row 30. Uh, 112 people total, and uh, Jay was one of those. Um, Hopefully this makes sense in a moment, but bear with me if it doesn't, and I'll get to it. But when I look back at the plane crash, probably some of the time before we hit, knowing we're going to, the plane crash itself, some of the crazy aftermath on the ground that I described, and I left out a lot of details I know. But when I look back at the plane crash, I see for me, and I've done this for a long time now, the easy part. Honestly, the crash seemed like it was easy compared to what happened after that. I remember this like it happened yesterday. I'm driving here last night from Dent from uh, Greeley, Colorado, after I did a football game, and I'm just thinking, man, this is like it happened yesterday. But I was urged by uh, some friends and family to see a trauma counselor. And I, I was feeling fine. I mean, I was going through the effects of the crash and trying to deal with the media and, and the, some of the family members of people who died and some survivors, and I'm trying to kind of juggle everything. I thought I was doing fine, but um, I... Uh, uh, did what a lot of people were urging to me, and I, and I scheduled a meeting with a counselor that United Airlines had, had um, lined up. So we sat down in my office. He came to my office. We sat down in my office. He was in there for maybe about 10 minutes, 15. That's about it. And he said to me, I'll never forget this. He said, Jerry, all I want to do today is give you a warning. I want to warn you today about what's going to happen to you next. I want to warn you about post-trauma stress disorder, PTSD. I had never heard that term before. Honestly, I'd never, I'd, I was like, say that again? How many words is that? Do I need to write that down? What's a post-trauma, what, what are you talking about? He said, no, post-trauma stress disorder. He said, because of what you went through, and he knew that everybody around me passed away. The guy on my left died. His wife died. The little boy in front of me, he was 18 months old, died in the crash. Woman across the aisle, guy behind me, J7 rose back. He knew that all these people around me did not survive the crash. He said, because of your particular circumstance, I can identify four stages of post-trauma stress that you're going to go through now. Stage one, he said, is going to be survivor's guilt. You're going to feel guilty because you survived this crash and so many people around you did not. Stage two is going to be anger. You're going to get mad. You're going to want to lash out at whoever might be responsible for the crash. Stage three, he called listlessness, where things that used to have value in your life, meaning your life, like spiritual convictions, well, I didn't have any at that point, but your family, your job, they won't seem to mean that much to you anymore. And stage four is going to be depression. He said 99% of the people who came out of your crash alive will suffer these four symptoms of post-trauma stress. But just know, he told me, they're a natural consequence of what you went through, and you can work through them. That guy, friends, stood up and walked out of my office, and I said to myself, the things he just described happened to other people. Are you serious? Happened to me, Jerry Schimmel? Forget it. Tough Midwestern morning race, guys. Every time you got down, down, knocked down, what do you do? You pick yourself back up, right? You don't need a lot of help. You certainly don't get depressed. I worked my way through college and law school. My parents never gave me a dime for anything. I always felt like I earned everything in my life, and I was going to make sure that uh, I was going to stay on track. Nothing could knock me down. But you know what happened? 
All the things that trauma counselor said would happen to me did just like he said they would. The survivor's guilt hit, the anger hit, the listlessness hit, and the, the depression hit. And for a period of about a year after that crash, I went on this downward spiral in my life that I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know why. I didn't know what to do about it. I quit my job with the league about two months after the crash. My marriage, my, my wife and I had been married four years, had an incredible marriage, hanging by a thread a year after the crash. Um, I, I have six brothers and sisters. We're all really close. My parents were alive back then. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even talk to them when you turn their telephone calls. All I could think about was that crash, and it, and it just kept consuming me. It wasn't like I was dysfunctional. I'm, I, was still, I was still living, but I was just in this funk that I could not get out of, and I couldn't sleep. That was the biggest thing, I think. I couldn't sleep, and when I'd finally uh, get to sleep, I'd have this nightmare, same one over and over, this little boy in front of me. Uh, in one moment, he's playing peekaboo over the seat back with me, which is what happened in the, in the plane. Hit the ground, he's over here, and he's gone. I, I just I, I could not process all that. And 10 months after the crash, it kind of came to a head for me, and something happened I want to share with you guys. 10 months after the crash, I'm struggling. I am really struggling in my life. Physically, I'm fine. I had some bruises and hurt my back a little bit. Physically, I'm fine. Emotionally, I'm a wreck. My marriage is falling apart. Diane's talking about moving back to Topeka. Uh, I didn't know what was going on. And I sat down on a chair in a little apartment we had in Denver, and I realized that for the first time in my life, first time in 30 years, I was 29 at the time of the crash, now 30 years old, first time in 30 years, I had been knocked down, and I could not pick myself back up. I couldn't do it by myself anymore. And I was not a religious person. I had no spiritual foundation whatsoever. My wife was a beautiful Christian woman, had been so from the day I met her, and I kind of went along with that. And, and uh, I, because I was in love with her and wanted to spend the rest of my life with her, I went to church with her. Um, which is a big deal for me. And um, I always, when I went to church and was done with church, I always felt that was the longest hour and a half of the week. No offense at all, Jeff. I mean, I'm sure it was a good sermon, but I couldn't wait to get home and watch those football games. Um, but I went to church with my wife. That's, that's how strong and emotional love is. It'll make a guy go to church with his wife. That's pretty good stuff. Um, and I, I just... I, I didn't know what to do with my life. So I sat down in that chair that night, and I just said a simple prayer to God. I had never prayed to him before, even on that plane before we hit. I wasn't praying. I just, I just told God, I can't do this by myself anymore. I have been knocked down, God, and I cannot pick myself back up. Would you please come into my life and give me some kind of relief from this crash? Not a specific prayer to save a marriage or to come out of depression or to get a new job. It was, God, just please give me something to hold on to here. And when I said that, I know some of you are going to be skeptical when I say this. You think it's corny, but man, I swear it could happen this way. When I said that, something came over me. It wasn't an audible voice. I think it was an audible voice. I would, would feel like I was going crazy. Not an audible voice. It wasn't a, a physical sensation. It was this overwhelming feeling of peace and contentment that just moved through me that said to me, because of what I had done, and more importantly, the ally I just invited in my life, that I was going to win every single battle. I knew it was not going to be easy. It was going to be really hard. It was going to be really difficult to battle Flight 232. But I knew in that moment that because of who I had fighting the battle with me, I was going to win. I felt great. I was, I was changed after saying that prayer. I slept that night, got up the next morning, and I told my wife what happened. And we weren't even talking, so it was you know, a breakthrough for me even to say something to Diane. And uh, by the way, um, in your marriage, if you're having trouble in a relationship, not talking gets you nowhere. Okay, I'm just, that's free advice, okay? If you go to a counselor, they charge 150 bucks for that. I'm giving that for free. Um, anyway, I, I was actually talking to my wife, and I said, hey, I'm feeling great. Do you have any advice for me? Because I knew that she had made this decision for Jesus a long time ago. I respected that, but I kept my distance from it. And she said this to me, and we've known each other for 41 years. We've been married 36 and dated for five, known each other for over, well over 40 years. This might be the best piece of advice my wife has ever given me. She said, I'm no expert at this, but it might not be a bad idea to start reading the Bible. <laughs> not bad advice for anybody, is it? Pastors over there going, yeah, there we go. Um, confession to make to you guys this morning. I had never opened this book. I had never in 30 years read the Bible. We had a King James Version at home, I think, and I opened it one time, and I was so bored with it, I was like, no, forget this. I had never read the Bible. I'd seen Bible verses before, football games, posters, whatever they might be. I had never opened this book and read it. And I thought, what's well, a book? Where do you start? You start at the beginning, right? My wife said, well, not necessarily. Let's, let's do it this way. And I started reading this book, and I came across a couple of passages that knocked me over the head, guys. 
John 3, 16. We all know that one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will never die but have eternal life. In Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, but a gift from God, and not by works so that no man boasts. I had been asking myself a question in 10 months after that plane crash every day over and over and over. And the question was this. If I had died in that crash, if I died like the guy right here, I mean, he, we're next to each other, we're touching each other as, as we came in for a final approach. If I, the ceiling caved in when we flipped over, took out he and his wife. If I had died like this guy, little boy in front of me, Jay seven rows back, the, the one across the aisle, the guy, be, if I had died like all these people around me in this circle of people, where would I be today? And my answer to that question for 10 months was this. I'd be in heaven with God for this reason. I had been a really good person in my life. I had worked with handicapped kids. I'd stay true in my marriage. I, I didn't make a lot of money, but I gave money away. I had done all these good deeds. I had impressed God so much with the way I lived my life in 30 years. He couldn't help but let me live in his house. I thought I had done enough good deeds to earn my way into heaven. That's not what this book says, is it? That's not what God is telling us. God says the only way to heaven, the only way to salvation, is through his son, Jesus Christ. For it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith, not of yourselves, but a gift from God. And he says, not by works, so man, no man boast. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will never die, but have eternal life. God says in his word to us, in his talk to us, he said, there's only one way to me, and it's through my son, Jesus Christ. A little bit later, I sat down in that same chair in our apartment, and I said something like a sinner's prayer that completely changed my life. I told God that I believed Jesus was his son, because I knew I had to make this. I want to be like my wife and have my, my sins forgiven, my spot in heaven secured. I knew I had one more big step to take, and I did that. I told God that I believed Jesus was his son, that I wanted to open my heart and let him live there. I wanted my sins forgiven. I wanted my spot in heaven secured. It was a sinner's prayer. And it took me about 10 seconds to say it back then like I did this morning. And you know what, guys? It is the greatest thing I have ever done. It's the greatest decision I will will ever make. It's the greatest decision you will ever make. Are you kidding me? To know exactly where you're going, you leave this earth, to have every sin you ever committed wiped clean, God says, every sin you ever will commit, God says, I'll take it. I'll cast it as far as the east is from the west. What an amazing way to live. And better yet, for all of us someday, what an amazing way to die. God says, one way and one way only, and it's through my son. He says, there's only one. I wish that I could stand up here this morning and stop right there and sit down and have the music come up again. I can't do that. I have confession to make. Um, I faltered in my faith a little bit. I started uh, experiencing things that really hurt. And I can tell you this, being a Christian in today's society is not easy. Man, it's not. I see some of the young people in this room, and, and maybe they made that decision for Christ already, and it's, gonna be, it's not going to get any easier. I'm going to tell you that. And, and God understands that. In fact, it's very difficult. I have two kids, as, as Jeff mentioned. They're adult kids now. They're 30 and, and 23. And uh, back when they were younger, they went to Columbine High School in Denver. We know all about Columbine uh, well after the shootings there. But our daughter first graduated in 2011. And when she was a senior that year, um, I asked her a question. I said, because I had to experience all this uh, this pushback on, on trying to tell people about Jesus. And I'm, I got six siblings and none of them would listen to me. They're, none of them are saved. And I just, I was like, I just knocking on a door that was never answered. I just got so discouraged by that. And I asked my daughter when she was a senior, I said, what if you took your Bible to church? She's, she had made a decision, she was a Christian. What if you took your Bible, I'm sorry, took your Bible to school, Columbine High School, public school. What if you took your Bible to school and put it on your desk? What would happen? She said this, interestingly. She said, well, I got a couple friends who I know are not Christians. They make fun of people of faith. I know it probably, because I kind of like these people. One of them I play volleyball with. Um, I I think I'll probably lose them as a friend if I put this Bible on my desk. Then she said, there are two teachers that I know are not Christians that um, have said some things that really kind of hurt a little bit as far as Christianity goes. I think if I put my Bible on my desk in those classes, I would have a completely different relationship with those teachers. And I thought, man, that is so discouraging. I know it's a public school, 
but that's still discouraging to me. And then um, our daughter, who's got this incredible personality, she's a, she's a school nurse now in Denver, but she said, Dad, if you want me to do that, I'll do it. Tell, tell me when. I'll, I'll put it on my desk and see what happens. I know, no, no, you don't have to do that. I, just, I was just thinking hypothetically. But it made me think. And then six years later, kids are separated by six years, Ryan, our son, is a senior at Columbine, asked him the same question. And he had a similar answer and then one more thing to it that I can add. He said, I've got some friends that I know are not Christians that have made fun of Christians I've heard. If I put my Bible on my desk in front of them, they would look at me differently. I would probably lose them as friends. He said, I got one teacher. I got a math teacher who I know is not a Christian. Um, and if I put the Bible on my desk in math class, I'm sure I'd be looked at way differently. Then he said this, and this is a good lesson for all of us, uh, how male and female are so different. <laughs> my son, uh, by the way, women in the room uh, and listening or watching online, males are different than females in a lot of ways. We think practically, okay? Let me give you an example. My son says, well, I got this girl that I really like, and if I, I know she's not a Christian. If I put my Bible on my desk in front of her, there was no chance for her. I would, I would have no chance. See, we think practically, all right? We think if we, you know, if we, we might have a shot of a girl, then we don't put the Bible on her desk. Um, anyway, so he told me that, and I just got discouraged by that as well. And it just seemed like uh, everywhere I went, that door was being shut, and my talking about Jesus. And then it came to a head about seven years ago, 25th anniversary of the plane crash. And the news media was making a big deal out of it, which was just fine nationally and especially in Denver. And a local TV station asked me to come out. I was doing the Rockies on the radio back then. And they asked me to come out to Coors Field um, and do an interview and talk about the, the plane crash and the 25th anniversary of it. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. So we had a night game. We met about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a brilliant sunshine day in, in July of uh, seven years ago. And it was a, about a five or six minute interview. And one of the questions after three or four minutes was, hey, how is it, Jerry, that you've been able to move forward and do all this, this great stuff and the cycling and the sports casting and just to be able to move forward and realize your dreams when so many people who survived your cl- crash have not been able to do that. They've been stifled by the plane crash. And my answer was, and it's a very truthful answer, I said, because of the strength I get from my relationship with Jesus Christ. He gives me that strength to go out and do these things and accomplish my goals and realize my dreams. Well, I got home that night and watched the, the news. You know what they did? They cut out the question and the answer. If you mention Jesus Christ, everything changes. You can mention, oh, you know this. Pastor knows this. You mention God, oh, that's fine. People think it's cool that, that you, you mention God. He believes in God, oh, that's great. But when you mention those other two words, Jesus Christ, what happens? Everything changes, doesn't it? Everything changes. And I got discouraged by that. And I... Um, went into a religion called, (laughs) uh, this is a little different than the first service, Um, what I call, looking back at it now, trick-or-treat religion. Halloween today, so why not? All right, here's a quick story. We moved into a house, a new house in Littleton, oh, 20-some years ago, uh, almost 20 years ago, and our kids were three and eight or nine, I think, at that time. We just moved this house in September, and October 31st comes around as Halloween. So the big deal in the neighborhood where we moved into was trick-or-treating, and apparently people make it up really big and get all this stuff. Anyway, two doors down from us was a widow that we had met when we moved in, and she supposedly had all this great trick-or-treat stuff. So that's the second house. So our kids are little. They're dressed up. We go to this house, ring the doorbell, and uh, the, this woman answers the door, and she said, oh, can you hold on a second? And sir, would you mind holding the door open? I said, sure, I'd hold the door. So she disappears, and she comes back with this gigantic tray, and she's like wobbling with this tray of all this stuff on it. I mean, you name it, she's got on this tray. She's got cake and cookies and candy and gum and licorice and all this stuff. My kids are just salivating. They're looking, looking at it. So she walks over, and I say, can I help you? No, I'm okay. She's like (laughs) barely able to hold this thing up, and she says to our kids, she said, just take, you know, two or three things and, and, you know, be on your way and, and whatever. So I don't know about your kids, but mine are this way. They're like, oh, man, I don't like this, so let me move this around. And, and Dad, can I have more than two things? No, you can't have more than two things. All right, well, I, I kind of like this kind of gum, but not this one. They're moving things around. It's like, guys, make decisions. I mean, get on. we got many other houses to go to. And they finally came up with two or three things each, all the stuff that they like, none of the stuff they didn't, none of it was harmful, none of it was painful. I call it trick-or-treat religion that I went through. I started this phase in my life where I thought, you know, maybe there's more than one way to heaven. People say there are. Maybe I, shouldn't be, I should be a little more lenient, not so strict. 
Maybe I should engage in, in trick-or-treat religion where I can take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Nothing doesn't taste too good. I got the right color. I got the right taste. I'll just take two or three things, put in my trick-or-treat bag, and that's my religion. I found out this. I found out that God says to trick-or-treat religion, he says no. He said no. No. No, Jerry. Trick-or-treat religion is not what God is telling us. It's not what this book says. It's not the truth. Here's the truth, guys. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will never die but have eternal life. Here's the truth. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, but a gift from God, and not by works, lest no man boast. There is one way, and there's one way only. Guys, there's only one, and his name is Jesus Christ. There's only one, and he's the one that took your place. There's only one, he's the one that walked off silently to the cross to take the, the punishment that we deserve, not him. There's only one whose father loves us so much that he let his son die so that we can live forever. There's only one, and his name is Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the, uh, the um, musicians to come back up again and get ready to play, and I'll finish up here in, in just a couple of moments. Um, when I look back at the plane crash sorry, 32 years ago, I still can't believe it's been that long. When I look back at what I went through, guys, here's what I see today, and I've done this for a couple of years now. I see God back at the time of that plane crash and the aftermath of it saying to me, Jerry, I finally got your attention. It took 30 years in a plane crash, but I finally got your attention. And now that I have it, I want to tell you about my son. And more importantly, I want you to spend the rest of your life telling other people about my son. That's why I survived that plane crash, so I could do just that, so I could be here, accept an invitation from Jeff to talk about Jesus. I'm here and survived that plane crash so that I can spend the rest of my life doing this. Uh, there are two groups of people in this room, and if you combine the people that might be watching online or that might eventually be watching online, put all those people together, we've got two groups of people. Group one is the one that has not made that decision for Jesus. A lot of us have in this room, but that there's some of us that have not done that. You have not had your sins forgiven. You're spotted in heaven secured. You haven't made that decision. Maybe there's something stirring in your heart today that might make you to do that. But the group one is the one that hasn't made that decision. The second group is the one that has that has made that decision, has opened up their heart and let Jesus take residence there, has their sins forgiven, has their spot in heaven secured. I am labeled a survivor. Uh, Jeff talked about it in the introduction, and that's just fine with me. I probably wrote that bio, so um, I probably put the word survivor in there. Survivor, when I speak to church groups, I'm, I'm labeled a survivor, a plane crash survivor. When I speak to secular groups and do the motivational thing, I'm a survivor, and that's just fine. I am. I'm a survivor. I survived a plane crash 32 years ago. But ponder this, if you would. Aren't we all survivors? We're here. Our heart's still beating. We're survivors, all of us. You haven't died in a plane crash. You haven't died in a car accident. You haven't died of cancer. Maybe there's some of you that have cancer, cancer survivors, but you're still here. You're a survivor. And ponder this. Maybe if you're in that first group of the people who have not made that decision for Christ, maybe you're a survivor for the same reason I was, so that God can tell you, maybe through people like me or Pastor Jeff, about his son. Maybe. If you're in that second group, you've made that decision for Christ already, maybe you're a survivor for the same reason I am, so that you can spend the rest of your life telling other people about Jesus. If you're in group one, if you're in group two, maybe you're a survivor to tell other people and accept for yourself that there's only one, and his name is Jesus. Thanks for letting me share with you guys. I appreciate it, Jeff. Thanks for the invitation. God bless you guys.